It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. It is Jill on Money. I'm Jill Schlesinger. And we are broadcasting live from the Capital One Bank Studios here in New York. Remember, this is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. And uh, there are a lot of mysteries out there. So we usually start the program with a a caller, but caller said we had to wait a little bit. So we're just going to do a quick bit of emailing, okay? First from uh, a guy named Mark who says, wants to know how to find a new financial planner. And, you know, look, there's lots of different opportunities for you to get great advice out there. And in fact, in honor of the just deluge of questions that we have been getting about this very topic, I updated our uh, resource list. And Mark, I see that you updated it, but you didn't update the title of it that is on the resource page. It says, still says 10 questions. And we're going to get that fritzed up. He says, we're going to fritz that up. Anyway, so it's 13 questions to ask about financial advice. It's not just the questions that you're going to ask the professional, but some of those questions are questions you should ask yourself, Mark, not Mark the producer, Mark the person sending this. I mean, the first one is, do you really need someone to help you out with your money? That's, that's a good place to start. And we go into some other questions around, you know, can you use a robo or an online platform or a human being? And then we get into some of the questions. But also in this post, what we're going to do is make sure that you can see that there are lots of places, uh, you know, the CFP board, which is let's make a plan dot org. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, you can click on the link to the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors or NAPFA. All these things are questions because, look, I don't know if you even need financial advice. There's that. Uh, okay, here's a question, but but go there and check it out, all right? Um, Stephen writes, is it a good idea to use a shorter duration target date fund which has more bonds? Um, right now, Stephen says, I'm using a 2030 fund. Um, and maybe it would be a good hedge against stock funds. Well, wait a minute. Why are you using a target date fund anyway? Maybe you should just use a stock index fund and a bond index fund. Maybe you don't even need a target date fund. I need to know more information, Stephen. But I think that if you're going that route and you're starting to really check out different types of allocations, then I would say it may be time for you to just do this on your own. Okay. Also, we got this really awesome email from somebody who wrote a note in Arabic. And I said to Mark, what does it say? And he says, I'm pretty sure it says, I love your book. All right. It may not say that, but it may be a bot. <laughs> anyway, let's go take our caller. We now have Nick from Milwaukee who's on the line. Hi, Nick. Hi. Uh, I had a question. I am I just recently purchased a house. Congratulations. Uh, I had a, uh, thank you. had a condo before that, which I sold. And I've made enough from the sale that I can pay down my mortgage to where I no longer uh, have PMI. Great. And I was wondering, I, I have the option of doing a recast and kind of reset the payments on the mortgage. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there would be any uh, benefit to doing that if I'm in the long term, if I'm paying, say, the same amount each month. Would there be any benefit to recasting and paying extra or just paying the normal payment now, which would be about as much as I can afford anyway? Okay, so let's just let's go back for a second. You sold a condo and you bought a new home. How much did you pay for the new home? Uh, 125. Okay. And the mortgage amount that you have for this home is how much? What's the outstanding? Uh, like, what did you borrow the total amount? Uh, 118. Okay. What do you mean? So how do you not have PMI? Um, well, I bought the house before I sold the condo, so I had to wait to get the money. Oh, to pay down okay. I, I got you. PMI. I got you now. So how much equity do you have to be able to pay down this mortgage? What did you get out of the uh, condo sale? Uh, I got about 30000 out of it, mm -hmm. but I had to 
buy appliances for the house. It didn't come with any, and there were some other expenses. So I'm going to be putting uh, about 20000 in. So you, ha- you have $20,000 available, essentially. And so mm-hmm. you're going to say to the mortgage company, let's just use round numbers. Um, you know, I have uh, I bought this thing for one hundred twenty five thousand and now I want a hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Right. Essentially. Right. You're going to pay yeah. it down. And mm-hmm. they're saying to you, OK, if you pay down this much equity, you can either have a payment that's exactly the same as what you had, including your PMI or how much. What's the recast give you? Like how much is the monthly savings? Oh, uh, I don't know that yet, actually. OK. Does it cost money to do the recast? Do they do it um, with, you know, with for fees or what? what's the story with that? Um, they said there'd be about one hundred and fifty dollars in fees. Oh, OK. I probably would recast it. Do you know what the rate is going to be? Is it going to be the exact same rate just without? Yeah. OK. What's your rate, by the way? Uh, four and a half. OK. This is what I would do. I would um, have them recast it. You know, it's a 30 year fixed rate. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, recast it. Um, hopefully your mortgage payment will go down a touch. And what you do with that extra money is a different question. So tell us, so I, and then don't make any extra payments. Don't do anything. So just keep whatever the lower payment is fine. Even if it's 50 bucks a month, I don't care. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. How old are you? Uh, 33. Married, single? Single. Okay. And do you have a job? Uh, are you using a retirement plan through work? Yes. How much are you putting into your retirement plan? Uh, 7%. Okay. How much do you earn right now? 50000 a year. 50? 50? 50? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So once you have the mortgage amount, once you're sort of like at this new level, whatever it is, um, you said you probably don't have tons of extra money, but will you? Do you have an emergency reserve fund that you have, like just some, not the proceeds from the condo sale, but do you have some money that's just safe money for yourself? Yeah, I have a bunch of uh, savings bonds, about eleven thousand dollars worth. Oh, perfect. That's great. Okay, so what I would say is this: you may want to save what. Again, you're going to save some money on a monthly basis. You may want to beef up your emergency reserves just a tiny bit, just because, you know what, as you said, you own a house now, things happen. Um, uh, Someone gave me very good advice in the real estate business. They said, you know, it's a pretty good idea to have some money set aside just for being a homeowner, essentially, you know, one or two percent of the purchase price just to have that every year. You're going to have things that happen. So what I would say is the 11,000 in the savings bonds is sacrosanct. Don't move it. Beef up your savings a little bit. And then you can actually increase your contribution to your 401k. Maybe you go up to 10 percent. And that's what you do with that extra money that you have on hand every single month. That's a better use of your money than plowing every single dollar into your mortgage and then also, you know, using that higher payment to pay your mortgage down faster. I'd rather use your money today to put money into the retirement plan. Does that make sense? Yes. That's what I would do. Okay. During the break, head on over to JillOnMoney.com and you can subscribe for our free weekly newsletter. Uh, Just check it out, jillonmoney.com, and there you can always click on Contact Us, and we will be happy to make sure that you get on the air and we can answer your questions. Okay, we'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to jillonmoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And if you would like to get on the air with us and just give us your, your all of your background, all the information we need to help you out with your financial life, just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. That's what Michelle did. She's calling from Georgia. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks, Jill. What can I do for you? Well, um, my dilemma is this. My husband and I are going to retire in a few years. We're thinking around four years. We have been thinking maybe we need some help trying to figure out exactly how to manage our money and what the best way of getting money out of certain accounts and the tax situation around what we 
uh, use when. And so we've been interviewing some uh, financial advisors, or they've approached us, some of them. I like to do things myself a lot of times. I, I really like investments. I'm researching and knowing more about it. And all these investors want to charge us, of course, because we're using their services. They're going to charge us a fee, which is fine. Mm-hmm. Um, however, it's going to be at least $10,000 a year, probably more. Hold on. Let's and- just go back up for one second. So you're four years from retirement. Tell me how much money have you saved in retirement assets, approximately? In 401k, mm-hmm. um, we have about... Two and a half million. Okay, great. And how about non qualified or non retirement assets? I've got about 400000 in a, a Vanguard account that just has a lot of different uh, index funds mm-hmm. in it. Mm-hmm. We have money. My husband has gotten a lot of um, stock. So we've got a whole bunch of stock in his old company about a half a million dollars and that's that's in, vested and just straight up yes. publicly traded stock yes got it that, and that's in an account and then he's got other stuff coming i love uh, that kind in the <laughs> yeah i mean that's why four years because four years from now he will be getting other stock from his new company okay so, so there's He's got probably one and a half million dollars in stock from old company and new company, either in our account or coming. Uh, and, and of course, it depends on the price. Exactly. The exactly. I was going to say. So how old yeah. are you guys? I'm 56 and he's 57. OK. And and we also one more thing. We also yeah. have I have about four hundred thousand dollars in money markets just for safety. Right. Well, just for safety, yeah, I'm thinking that's probably too much to have. In a I don't know. Market, I'm a, so. I am a wimp, Michelle. I am okay. I am way wimpier than most people would imagine, and I do know that you know when bad things happen, that extra right. money that everyone tells you is inefficient and stupid to keep in cash can feel pretty darn good. How much do you think you guys need to live on? Let's you know put the clock ahead by four years. What do you think you need? We're pretty frugal in our day-to-day activities. Um, however, we do want to travel. Mm-hmm. So we were thinking we could live off of you know, $150,000, 160000 a year. Okay. So, and I, I know that the million dollars that's coming in in stock, we can't count on it. Right. We can't count on that it's going to be worth a million is it possible that I could ask you to just give me like a guess? Like, what would you like if you could say worst case scenario? I think it'll be worth X. What do you think X would be? Should we assume that that's really worth zero right now, or should we assume that that has some value? Um, I think no. I think it has some value because um, both the companies are fairly stable mm-hmm. and strong. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I think it has some value. Um, you want to mark yeah. it down by some amount? Do you want to mark it down by half? Do you want to say, like, worst case, it'll be worth the million that's coming in would probably we'd probably get half of that? Yeah, the million is coming in. Yeah, go ahead. All right, let's just be boring. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> We're conservative, right? Sir. So, and you own your home? Um, we own. Well, I uh, we still own owe about one hundred and seventy thousand dollars on the okay. mortgage. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm doing quick back of the envelope calculation for you as mm-hmm. we speak. See, I'm, I'm hoping that you speak slower so I can type faster into my calculator. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. All right, <laughs> so I just ran quick calculation. I like to take a discounted value of stock that's expected because it's not in your account yet. So it is hard for me to say that's an absolute guarantee. In other words, it's not like a cash bonus that's been guaranteed and you just right. have to wait to earn it. So if I look at your total holdings, you've got about 4.3 million bucks. I'm sure you've got equity in your home because that's more right. than, right? And uh, if you look at your life, I, I guess that most people when they retire, what they always say is, oh, I I presume I'll just downsize. And so don't presume that. Presume you're just going to use your equity in some other ways. 4.3 million about. When I do the calculation, uh, that you can use a withdrawal rate of, you know, some investment places will say four and a half percent a year and you'll be fine. You won't run out of money. 
But if you're conservative, that's not a great bet because that that will make you a little nutty. So Mm -hmm. what I would suggest is you use a 3% withdrawal rate, which is really super wimpy, and that will give you about 130 grand a year and you won't run out of money. And that kind of works pretty well for you guys. You said you need 160. And, you know, in the first few years, you won't, you know, before you get uh, Social Security, you'll need to spend down some of the already taxed money. But once you get Social Security, you're both going to get you both worked your whole lives. You're probably going to be in great shape. Okay, Mm -hmm. so now I'm going to tell you that most people who call me and they're 56, 57 years old, I say, nah, you can't do it. I think you can do this. (laughs) This is great. So Mm -hmm. um, this is not a pipe dream. This is real. So now the question really is about whether you can do this yourself. And I don't know what people have been quoting you in terms of charging, but, you know, fees can range for investment management services, you know, in your category. Like literally, you could go to a robo-advisor and you can pay as little as 0.25% a year, Mm -hmm. right? That's pretty great. Mm -hmm. But then you Mm -hmm. can go to a full-service, amazing CFP, who also does a great amount of tax planning and customizes things, and but it's going to cost you more. And chances are with right. four million bucks, it's going to cost you, I don't know, a half to maybe 75 basis points. So you're going to pay up right. for this, right? Right. So right. now the question becomes, how much do you need that hand-holding personal service of a dedicated person whose office you want to actually enter on an annual basis and you know how comfortable you are with that because Mm -hmm. the asset allocation part is not going to be the hard part for you guys what is it that you think you need the most in the relationship with a CFP the taxes is what I I wonder about Mm -hmm. you know tax strategy around when to sell stock Mm -hmm. versus when to pull it out the money out of, you know, the 401k versus, you know, that's what I think I need the most help with. And so I'm wondering, do I really need a CFP or do I just need a really good CPA? You might have consider this is kind of uh, wacky, but I can give it to you. There is one more certification that's not as popular that I want to just flag for you. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I actually like this credential. It's It's a CPA can get a credential called the PFS. So you're a CPA and you want to do financial planning. And then you can get a certification that's called the CPA PFS, Personal Financial Specialist. And what this basically does is this is a CPA who specializes in personal financial planning. I mean, they are different because they come from a real CPA background. Mm -hmm. And that may be interesting to you. Any CFP worth his or her salt should be able to help you. But if that's if it's really a tax issue, this may be something you should consider. And mm-hmm. if you need help, you know, offline, you, Mark will tell me where you live and I can find you somebody who does this. Okay. The bottom line for you, you're in great shape. I'm so happy for you because, as I said, many people who call up in their 50s, late, you know, mid to late 50s, You're not going to get to 60 and retire the way you want. You guys are. Okay, we will be right back. Going to pay some bills during the break. Hop on to JillOnMoney.com and buy the book. JillOnMoney.com. Click on the link to the book. It's called The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. Hey, it could be a nice graduation gift. All right, we'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And uh, this is basically the last month I'm going to work really, really hard for the summer. That's it. It has been a bruising five plus months here in Jill on Money land. A great five plus months of 2019, but exhausting. And also exhausting for poor Mark, who had to give birth to his kidney stone. I don't even think he gave birth. I think it's just hiding somewhere, right? Uh, And uh, a baby. And and I birthed my book. (laughs) 
it's been a crazy year, 2019, so far. So what I'm going to try to do, I don't know if I'm really going to be able to do it, but I'm going to try to take a big chunk of time off, not from the radio, but just to kind of do a more modified schedule. You guys won't notice a thing. It's going to be seamless. But here's the thing. If you would like to send us a note, you know what I should do, Mark, when I take that chunk of time off? Just forward me all emails and I should just answer them. I mean, not all, but you know what I mean? Like a a bunch of them that I can just respond to. Or, you know, you now that you are CFP almost, almost, not yet, uh, maybe you could answer some of them. I know. You get more of that. Anyway, do send us a note. It's askjill at jillonmoney.com. Here's a nice note that we got from some, uh, can you believe this? I love getting something from someone at cfpb.gov. Hi, Jill. Um, I'm Laura, a senior content specialist at the CFPB. We're so pleased to hear you recommend money as you grow to listeners as a resource for children and adults alike. So this is so cool. I've worked, she's worked, Laura's worked on money as you grow since it came to the CFPB in 2015 as part of the Office of Financial Education. So remember, what happened was Money As You Grow was a was actually, this content was developed by friend of the show, Beth Kobliner, and then it got housed under the CFPB. So I'm hoping that we can get Laura on the program or get some people out there uh, from, from the CFPB who can talk about some financial education. You know what, Mark? Let's book somebody. Maybe we should do sort of a back to school. We'll see. Poke around, Mark. See what you got. And uh, that's cool. Thanks for writing. Uh, This is a note from Victoria. And she says, the subject is stocks are in my name and I added my son and daughter's name. Should I change them as beneficiaries? Can I leave it? Are there tax implications? Once you put anyone's name on an account, there are automatic tax implications. Depends on kind of how you do this. So, you know, a lot of people do this with their homes and I've warned about it. The problem is, let's just say it's an additional signer on a bank account. That's different. Uh, Let's say it is something called a TOD or a transfer on death and then your kids' names will pop up. But once you make your kid a joint owner of the account, It's considered a gift. So if you had a stock or mutual fund account, non-retirement account, right? And you say, oh, I'm going to add my daughter, Jill, on the account. And you just put my name on that account. You know what happens? It's as if you gifted me half of the account. So it can have a tax, uh, it can cause a tax problem. It could cause an estate issue where instead of your kids inheriting that asset and having the cost basis step up, meaning increase at your death, that the kids half of the account is essentially treated as her or his own. So before people just start willy nilly adding names to accounts, I would encourage you to make sure that you are doing this for the right reason and consulting an attorney before you do it. Okay? Peter writes that uh, his wife will be 62 this summer. He's going to be 65 in early 2020. They both still work. So Peter says, I'm going to wait. I was going to wait until 66 years and two months to collect my Social Security. But... I was thinking, would it be wise for my wife to start collecting at 62? My benefit would be more than hers. Any direction on this scenario would be greatly appreciated. You know, I hate these Social Security questions sometimes because I'm really not a total Social Security expert. And whenever whenever I've had a Social Security so-called experts on the show, what they do is they say, you should call Social Security. Like, not exactly the right answer. I think that this works for, and I think that she can draw her benefit and then switch to yours, I think. 
but I'm not 100% sure. So what you could do is you could call Social Security, which is annoying, but there are also some Social Security calculators out there. And the other thing is I wanted to make a plug because a lot of times people have questions about, um, you know, whether or not to claim Social Security or Social Security claiming strategies. You know, there's this cool website called rsplanner.com. And I haven't talked about it a lot. I really want to get this guy in the show. Mark, what's going on? We, weren't we trying to get the guy on the show? Kotlikoff, isn't that his name? Um, and I think that this is a really interesting uh, website because it does planning, but it does it at a flat fee. And it's usually like, I don't know, it's like 120, is it, I think maybe, net, oh, not RS, it's ES Planner. I'm sorry, I keep saying RS, ES Planner, duh. Uh, ES Planner, that's the right one. All right. So what I think you might want to check out is something called E planner.com and the reason is that it allows you to do broader financial planning for retirement and weaves in social security and you know look I, I, I'm just I just popped onto the website and we have a link to this on our website but what's kind of cool is it has all sorts of different inputs and I think it could be really helpful to incorporate all these different social security scenarios into that kind of planning. So check out esplanner.com and let me know what you think. All right, good luck. You're listening to Jill on Money and to click on to the ES Planner and other resources, go to jillonmoney.com, click on the resource tab. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Got a question? Send us a note. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Go to our website, JillOnMoney.com. Sign up for the free weekly newsletter. Woo! Okay. Um, here's, you know, I wish the IRS, as much as I love the IRS website, I just wish some of the rules were a little bit more straightforward. It does make it a bit more difficult for us, the mortals out there. So why do we have to do half year kind of things? Okay, let's get to this. Um, here is a note from, what is this woman's name? Hold on. Bernice. I'm a widow. I'm going to turn 70 and a half this year. And I have some questions about taking my required minimum distribution. So here's what she's got. Two annuity IRA accounts and some IRA money invested with a broker in a TD Ameritrade account. So is it best to take the RMD from each one of the annuities and the IRA funds in the TD Ameritrade, or should I take the total from one or two of these accounts? The rule is you don't have to take money from each of your IRA accounts. If you have more than one IRA, you can calculate your required minimum distribution for each IRA separately, but you can aggregate the amount you take. You can just take it from one. So I don't know whether it makes sense to annuitize your accounts or not. I don't know what those annuities are actually paying you or what the other investments are. So you don't have to take a separate required minimum distribution from each account. But um, I don't know whether or not, you know, she, she follows up with a question about annuitizing. Maybe annuitization would work well for you. I don't know. You've got to really, I need more information about what is the annuitization what are the costs of these annuities? Where does it where does it stand? And then the second, there, so that so we need a little more information. <clears throat> excuse me, but the mo most important piece is when you have multiple IRAs, you only need to take the chunk of money for all required minimum distributions from one account. Okay. Next question: If I receive more money from the RMD than I need to live on, what would be a good investment choice? Totally depends. In other words, if your distribution 
is 20 grand for the year and you only need to spend 15 of it, I don't know what to do with the other five. Maybe put it into a safe checking, saving money market account. Maybe add it to a general investment account. It depends what else is going on. So I just want you to know that Bernice finishes this by saying, I'm asking for your assistance because I am not too confident in the advice I get from my current financial advisor. You know, talk about burying the lead. This to me is the critical part of Bernice's question. Why are you still with someone who you have no confidence in? Or not too much confidence? I think it's time to get a new advisor or shop around at least. Okay, Uh, Barry is writing in with the subject, Parent Loan Nightmare. I have $147,000 federal parent loan at 7%. $10,000 of interest in 2018 was only only tax-deductible piece. Should I mortgage two homes to pay off the loan at 5% interest? 100% tax-deductible interest. Hold on one second. Can we just talk about this? You can't do what you think you're going to do. I mean, you can refinance a loan. You can basically say, I'm going to refinance my house, get a lower rate, and pay off the student loan. However, because of the tax law change, when you refinance your home, the amount that is not attributable to the house or to home improvements, meaning paying off other debt, is no longer eligible for mortgage interest deduction. Got that? So the reality is that if you are looking at this from the standpoint of getting a better tax deduction, you it's, it won't happen. Now, here's the other thing. It may be in your best interest to refinance your mortgage to get a lower rate, but I don't know. And there are costs that are associated with this. So I want to know about how much are the houses, how much are the houses worth? What are the current mortgages that are outstanding on them? If you have them and what else is going on in your financial life? Essentially, I want you to come on the show with me. Could you do that? That would be so good. Because it's very, very hard to do this without a little bit more information. Linda is now a single woman and she's floored at the amount of taxes I have to pay. Why? Is there anything I can do to reduce them? I don't know. I mean, like, you're floored. Did you not know how much much you were paying in taxes previously? I don't know. Uh, So I'm I'm not sure about that. I'd need more information. It would be interesting to find out what your taxable income is and why you th- why you are paying so much come on come back with me i need some more information pretty please 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 all right mark's giving me the wrap it up sign all right you <laughs> no more questions for you schlesinger all right uh it's jill on money and uh, hey you shopping around for a new financial advisor i, l- I got a website for you napfa n-a-p N-A-P as in Peter, N-A-P-F-A, napfa.org. Check that out. They'll help you out. Those are uh, folks that won't sell you anything, so that's kind of cool too. All right, Jill on Money. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. That's what Ron did. And he says, I have $50,000 in a non-retirement mutual fund account and pay taxes on it every year. I know I can't just transfer it from a non-retirement account to a retirement account, but I think I can sell $13,000 this year, $14,000. Next year, keep doing this. And oh, okay, so what he's basically saying is he thinks he can sell a certain amount of money, a certain amount of the, the uh, mutual fund and pay zero tax on it to keep him in the 0% tax bracket. So 
long-term capital gains rate, the 0% bracket, married filing jointly, it's up to $78,750. So if you sell enough and you can stay below $78,750, your income plus what you've sold is under that amount, zero tax. So yeah, you can totally do this. And um, if you sold, if you essentially sold the all of it in one chunk and you jumped up into the next tax bracket, that would be the 15% tax bracket. Anyway, um, and then if you if you were somehow thinking about, and I'm not sure why he's bringing up. So he also brings up the uh, an in kind transfer. I'm not sure why you would do that. I mean, I don't know what you're thinking about doing with that. So anyway, long story short is you can sell an asset, you can cash it out, and if you can qualify to put it into a retirement account, the proceeds, if you still have income, that's great. And if you can put it into a Roth IRA, that would be great. And if you can put it into a non-deductible IRA, presuming you have no other IRA accounts, you can do a backdoor Roth, put it into a non-deductible IRA, turn around and turn it into a Roth IRA. You got to do a little research on this. And again, if you have other IRA accounts, this will not work. Okay. Now, here we go. It is Jill on Money. We are broadcasting live from the Capital One Bank Studios here in New York. If you've got a financial question, hop onto our website, jillonmoney.com. We will be right back with more of your great questions. It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome back. It's our number two. Very exciting. We are broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Go to policygenius.com. Mark, did you buy some insurance from Policy Genius? What'd you buy? Oh, not from them. You just looked at it. Mark is a big online insurance purchaser. Got to up that coverage now that you got the baby. <laughs> uh, all right. We've got a great guest for you. Here's what happened. I read the New York Times and I see an opinion piece that literally says, consider firing your mail broker. This got my attention for sure and certainly got the attention of many people who kind of went nutty on this. Anyway, her name is Blair Ducanay. And here's the coolest thing. I had a connection to her. I didn't even realize it, that my friend Michael Goodman, who's been on the show previously, had said to me, well, you know, Blair, she has to work with me. So Blair Ducanay, who is an investment advisor now, it was great because I could get her into the studio and figure out what the heck she's talking about. Why should you consider firing your male broker? The uh, sub is years of research show female investors outperform men, but only about one in five brokers are women. So here is the beginning of our interview with Blair Ducanay. You started in this model of a brokerage house, a wire house as we call it. And what was it about that experience that, that you said, mm, this is not quite for me? What was it about that experience that you didn't like? Yeah, I did start on the brokerage side, which 15 years ago, that was really the only place to start with no experience. One of the good things about my experience there was I was not an advisor. I was not what they call a producer, somebody who had to go out and bring in clients in order to earn my pay. I was on a team. I was a salaried employee. So I learned the business. I learned the operations of the business. I learned client service. But after a few years, you start to realize there's a relationship with the client where you don't feel like you're on their side. Mm. There are pressures. There mm -hmm. are, you know, the office that you're in has um, goals that they're trying to set. They want to have so many clients using the banking products. They want to have so many clients using structured products, whatever it might be. And they have goals and they're going to go around and 
ask you to help them meet those goals. So there's pressures there. What did you find when you left that world? What was the, what was opened up to you? I had no idea that there was a way of being a financial advisor that didn't require being in a broker broker dealer. Oh. So by happenstance, I knew someone who on the mutual fund wholesaling side covered the independent channel and the broker dealer channel who introduced me to the first RIA firm that hired me. And which was that? Wealthstream Advisors. Wealthstream Advisors. Ladies and gentlemen, you may have heard that because Michael Goodman, who was on our program at the end of uh, last year, we did a year-end tax planning with Michael. So you are a Michael Goodman acolyte, but you no longer are with Wealthstream because you had to move to New Orleans because you wanted a better city with great food, and there was a spouse involved. Correct. I would probably still be at Wealthstream if I hadn't met my husband and moved to New Orleans. (laughs) So um, one of the reasons that we wanted to have you on is that you wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. Did you have any idea how crazy this was going to go? I knew it was a big deal. They approached me. They had seen a blog that I wrote about the lack of women in, in this field and asked me if I wanted to write it. And it took a couple of months between me mulling over it and the edits. So I was excited about it, but not until it was published did I realize how big of a deal it was. Did you write the headline or did they? They did. Okay. So the headline is consider firing your male broker. And the subtitle is years of research show female investors outperform men, but only about one in five brokers are women. Funny thing is that like when I looked at the word broker, like the hair in the back of my neck went up a little bit. That's their word, not your word, right? Yes. So you're not a fan of the brokerage model anyway. So let's start it with that premise. You like the model of a fiduciary advisor who's putting your best interest first at all times. We put that on the table. What was the big takeaway after the publication when you got the feedback? What, were, what was the sort of the positive and the negative that you received? Most of the feedback that I received was incredibly overwhelmingly positive. All of the men that I've worked with in my career agree. They know that there's not enough women. They've been trying to find more women. I think it's a it's a problem that has to come from both sides. We need more women to be interested, and then we need the firms to hire more women. So from that perspective, everybody in the industry agreed. A lot of people did take umbrage with the salacious title. Um, we did talk about, with the New York Times, the, the term broker and advisor, an advisor with an O versus an E. Yeah. And I think that's a topic for another op-ed that I would love to write. I decided that I had no problem with the word broker because, you know what, the investing public does not know the difference. Right. They use these words interchangeably. And to be honest, my title would have been, why aren't there enough women as financial advisors? And I doubt that would have gotten as many eyeballs reading it. Yeah. And also the idea that the whole financial services industry is really chasing after women and we are not attracting them. Why are women more willing to go into investment banking than in the advice-giving business? I use this analogy with other professions, whether it's accounting or law or medicine. There's a clearer path, and maybe in investment banking, there's also a clearer path. You do your two to three years, and then you make associate. In wealth management, you really have to work for a senior advisor, and you have to just hope that they're going to help you progress in your career. There's no clear delineation that you would get when you go to medical school. You're a doctor. Everybody's going to respect you. You have the white coat. When you go into accounting firms, they have the same clear progression to partnership in those firms. So I think it's just the lack of clarity that women don't see. How am I going to make it here? Mm. Um, That's one of many reasons, but I think it's a big one. I've also heard when I was doing some work with the CFP board and I would talk to young women, they would say, I don't want to go into these high pressure sales organizations. So so they were really, you started by saying that you were in a wirehouse, but you were part of a salaried team that learned the business. That's a lot different than like, hey, Blair, here's the, here's the white pages, go, and you eat what you kill. So part of the problem is some of the, the model doesn't really appeal to a ton of different people. Like when I say that my nephew comes out of Penn, none of his colleagues and cohorts wanted to go into this the retail business they sort of thought like ugh, that slimy sales business i don't want to do that how can we rectify that i think you really hit on a good point because most of the advisors in the broker firms who are going into this you know program of call all all of your friends and then call everyone in the phone book 
less than one in 10 make it. It's mm. not easy. It's, it's extremely difficult. And I, I absolutely agree. I never wanted to be in sales. Um, I love building relationships. And um, the sales part is a slog. I think what we're seeing now on the independent side with the fiduciary RIAs is that these businesses are finally moving past the single founder and a few staff. They're becoming real firms. They're growing. And so now they can offer these young professionals that salaried position that they were looking for, you know, 15 years ago. Right. Interesting. Okay, we'll get back to our interview with Blair Ducanet in just a minute. Hey, are you thinking about firing your male broker or even your female broker? Well, maybe you should head on over to JillOnMoney.com and click on the resource section and you can find a new one right there. Find a CFP, find someone from NAPFA, anything like that, or maybe get the questions you need to ask those people before you even start interviewing. It's at JillOnMoney.com, and we will be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You are back. It is Jill on Money. And we've got a real interesting guest for uh, one more segment. She had to go and do stuff. So come on. Uh, her name is Blair Ducanet. She's an investment advisor. And she wrote an op-ed in the New York Times that went viral. But she's really talking about how women are potentially, at least according to the research, better at managing lots of things in the financial world than men. So here is more or the end of our interview with Blair Ducanet. Besides the salacious headline, which I loved, you say that maybe the problems that occurred in the financial crisis may have some root in how many women were in the financial services business. Can you explain that? Certainly. If you look at the top of not only banks, but all corporations, there's very few women. I mean, less than 5% of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are women. Women, when they make it to the top, they tend to be uh, HR, general counsel. They're not in the operational business line model. Christine Lagarde, head of the World Bank and the IMF, had, quote, had was quoted saying, Maybe if there had been a few more women in leadership, we wouldn't have had this problem. And it comes down to gender diversity of teams that are making complex decisions. Gender diversity is the laziest form for cognitive diversity. What were all these banks doing? They had a complete blind spot. They had no idea that all of these mortgages they had levered up and put on their balance sheets could become worthless. And maybe if there was some more cognitive diversity among those teams, gender diversity being the easiest way to get that, we wouldn't have had such a problem. It's so funny that you say that because there are so many times where people will say, you know, you want to build a diverse team because I want to make the business model for doing that. And what you're saying, cognitive diversity is really true because when you get not just all white dudes making if who come from the exact same schools perpetuating their same stuff, you get someone who raises a hand and says, wait, why? But why are we doing this? Right. What is it about women that you think just the way that, and again, this is broad brush, but like the the focus is more goal oriented than transaction oriented. Is that how it, it kind of breaks down here? We're certainly seeing that with women as clients. Women as clients focus much more on the long term perspective, their financial goals than they do. How did we do against the S&P 500 last year, which seems to be you know a very common question from men as clients. So this characteristic is beneficial for the long-term investor. Remember, our brains are hardwired not to be good investors. Investing for the long-term is very hard. Um, it requires patience and discipline and a long-term view, which we're seeing women have more of that than men do mm -hmm. on average. I wonder if you think there are some there's some role to be played by how to how to make fiduciary the standard, right? Because we just in fact, I just answered a question that came in someone who said, how do I know if someone is a fiduciary? Is this a license? Why is it that the big fund families as well as the big wirehouses are so congenitally incapable of adopting a standard that puts their clients first? 
Well, if you go back to the original legislation in 1940 with the Investment Advisors Act, the broker-dealer firms were written an exception to the fiduciary rule because their primary business is the transaction of securities, buying and selling from their own account to their clients. They have an exception to the fiduciary rule that they are not giving advice except subsequent to an individual transaction. That's their entire business model. So you're talking about ripping apart the core of the business model there. And what's really fascinating is that when the Department of Labor tried to enforce a fiduciary standard only in retirement accounts, because that's where the only purview they had, a couple of years ago, the brokerage firms were taking out ads in the Wall Street Journal saying, we have your best interests at heart. And yet at the same time, their attorneys were fighting the DOL rule saying, we can't be fiduciaries because of our exception. So it's very confusing. We never really adopted, as other professions like law and medicine did, a fiduciary standard and a true profession. And that's really because those professions happened over a century ago. And this is the first generation of Americans who had to save for their own retirement. Mm. We had to find benefit plans, pension plans at work. People worked until the final years of their life. We're just now getting to the point where the average American has had to save for and plan for a 30-year retirement on their own. We're just really getting to the point where most Americans need a fiduciary in this space. I um, actually moderated a, a focus group on behalf of the CFP board and the Consumer Federation and AARP, and we got a group of investors around a table. We videotaped it. People had no freaking idea what role the person who was providing financial advice had. They didn't know whether it was a broker, an advisor, an advisor. Of course, you, you they would imagine that someone put their best interest first. They didn't know that there was no requirement not to put their best interest first. I just think that if you really want to be considered a profession and you're unwilling to put your client first, like would you go to a doctor and say, hey, I'd love to go come to you for medical advice but do what's right for you before me. Would we ever do that? Of course not. It's insanity, right? Tell me what you think about like CFP board going to a stricter standard this year in 2019. CFP board is trying to do the right thing. The problem that they're having is that the CFP was originally a designation for insurance agents to sell more insurance by doing financial plans. And a lot of their members are in insurance companies and broker dealers. And it's very hard for them to apply the fiduciary standard to certificate holders who don't work in that business model. So they're trying to say, when you're doing the act of financial planning as a CFP, you're going to be held to a fiduciary standard and you're going to have to have a separate contract. That's the other thing. What we have now with the broker dealer and hybrid RIA model, which is how a lot of independent firms operate, is that the advisor can, on the same client, at one point be operating as a fiduciary and then turn over in the other account and do a sales transaction and never have to tell the client that that's been changed. So I think the CFP board is trying to do the best they can, but it's very difficult for them considering who who their certificate owners are. So if someone's listening here and they want to know, well, how do I know? I want to Blair. By the way, you can get Blair yourself. You don't have to live in New Orleans. What do you think is the best way for people to seek financial advice? The first thing you have to find out is, does this person have an affiliation with a broker dealer or an insurance company or a bank? If they're in any of those models, even half of the time, they are licensed to sell you products. It doesn't mean that they're bad people, and a lot of them are very talented and might give good advice. They are in a business model that is subject to con- more conflicts because nobody's conflict-free. Right. We all have conflicts. But oh, so, Please ask my therapist about that. Do I have conflicts? <laughs> exactly. So what you want to do is find an advisor with an E who works at an RIA, a registered investment advisory firm, that has no affiliation with a broker-dealer. So if you go on the broker check website, this person should not have active licenses like the Series 7 or an active insurance uh, license. Okay. So you're not going to necessarily find that because if you go to the CFP website, if you go to letsmakeaplan.org, you're not sure. But if you go to NAPFA, well, you would have someone who is always held to the fiduciary standard and sells no product. NAPFA is one organization. You know that all of their members are going to be fiduciaries, but a lot of us who are fiduciaries are not necessarily members of NAPFA. That's the weird thing, right? So, so like that's the part of the confusion is because the models are so weird and 
gray areas exist in so many places, it's really hard for the consumer. So is the best question to ask simply, are you held to the fiduciary standard at all times? I would like to say yes, but when the DOL rule was still looking like it was going to come through, I heard that those who work at broker dealers were saying yes. And <sighs> in some way could because maybe they have a corporate RIA attached to a broker dealer. It's very confusing. I don't have the answer. We need to start an organization. Yeah. We need to do something about this. I agree. Somewhere where we could all be searchable. Right. right. That's what I mean. Like there was some database where you could say like, Fiduciary.org. This is where every fiduciary all over America. I got to talk to someone about this. You and I can make this happen. I'd be willing to help as much as I can. Let's do it. Thanks to Blair Ducanet for joining us. While we go to the break and prepare for all the questions you have, why don't you go to the website and check out all the great content that we are creating every single week here at Jill on Money. Just go to JillOnMoney.com. And you can check it out. Surf Around will be right back. Four hundred one Ks, IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You are back. It's Jill on Money. Mark's telling me to stop peppering somebody with emails because he says, I'm never going to get anywhere. It's just somebody who came on our program and we were very generous to, and, and this person won't has basically ghosted me and is not now returning the favor. Can you guess who it is? <laughs> now it's just fun, Mark. Now it's just going to be every, because you know you've been on the other side of that where you feel slightly guilty. Now I'm, I'm venturing into maybe becoming a nudge slash stalker. We'll see. Uh, but it's just, I don't know. I would thought we were very nice to this person. And Mark says I should have known better. Well, now we do know, but I'm going to try anyway. All right, let's get back to you. If you've got a financial question, send us a note. It's at askjill at jillonmoney.com or just go to the website, jillonmoney.com. Click on the contact us button and we will help you out. Hi, Jill. I hate using the fan word, but I am an avid listener to your show for how long? Who knows? I trust your judgment and I admire your wit and knowledge. A great combination. Oh, that's very nice. I see it. Don't you wish that we could have that as a, in her words, rather than me reading it about myself? Sounds sort of weird. Mark, get on that microphone and you read these. Okay. In a nutshell, I've had accounts with Charles Schwab, Fidelity, Mutual Fund Store, and American Century, just to name a few. I feel that I've gotten bad advice everywhere. Mm, Darn it. I'm not being negative. I just want advice I can trust. The markets have been high, but I feel my accounts don't reflect as much growth as they should. I was even talked into getting an annuity, which I regret, and my husband's not happy about it. I've heard you help others and was hoping you may know a reliable, intelligent person in my area who could review my accounts. If I liked them, I would switch to them. Someone who could just review and tell me all's okay. The financial planning I advice, the financial pr- advice I'm receiving is lacking. I'm 54. I've got bills, college on the horizon, two kids in a couple of years. Uh, you know, look, I feel like Many people have this very similar complaint. And I think it is now incumbent on us to demand that we just, we have to stop working with people who are selling crap and not giving us financial advice. So you've heard me talk on this show about the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, or NAPFA. And I think this could be a good resource. Now, I'm going to do a little research and help out this person in, uh, you know, just to try to see if I can kind of get to another place. Uh, But I want to be sure that everyone understands that if you're just paying money for service that is just a product sale or just like someone managing your money, you're, you, you just not, you deserve more. So we're going to try to help you out. And that's why I do really like the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. They take a holistic approach. They look at your money and your life, and they make you get on track with this. 
I, I like it. I was never a member of NAPFA. I wasn't when I was in the business. Anyway, uh, here we go. This is, I'll, I'll do a little work and follow up, okay? Uh, Diane is thinking of retiring soon, working for a company for over 45 years. Should I take a lump sum? I've heard pros and cons about this. Not sure what to do. I'd just like to get a monthly pension check for the rest of my life, but I worry something will happen that would affect the pension. If you get the money up front, at least you have it. What would you do? The question of taking a lump sum versus a pension check is about whether or not the company has funded the pension. I didn't mention the name of your company, but I think that one question to figure out is whether the company has an adequately funded pension. I don't mind a pension. I think that it might be worth your while if you're the type of person who just wants your monthly amount. That That's great. But remember, once you have that pension, you don't have liquidity. So I think that what I would do is I would first figure out, is this pension on shaky ground or not? And if it's not, do you have money outside of the actual pension fund that you could dip into? That would be a good question. Because I would hate for you to need the money or need some chunk of money that you don't have. So, I mean, the real pros of of a pension of pension income is pretty simple. You do get that monthly check, you don't have to worry about anything. The downside of that pension check is that you don't have the money and if something big were to come up, you don't have access to your money. And the other the other risk would be that the company changes the terms of the pension after you retire. I'm not sure if that's your case or not, but it's worth thinking about. Okay. Gary writes that he and his wife are 62 years old, 60 grand in a SEP account, $30,000 in credit card bills, high rates. My wife has an IRA, 130,000. Our retail business is down, so income's not there. Should we start taking retirement cash and some SEP number money to pay down bills? Can't find the answers. Mm. This is a tough one. Well, maybe what I would do is if I wouldn't necessarily start so- taking Social Security at 62. I think that's what you're asking. I don't think I would want to do that because now you're going to have a permanently lower amount. But here's a question. Could you take some money out of one of these accounts, maybe take, if your income is down, maybe it's, you do take some money out of either the IRA or the SEP and take them. I don't know if if you're going to bump yourself into another tax bracket. I don't know how much money you have, but if you can get some money out and pay down those credit card bills, that might really help you out. So let's see if, if you could, Let's say you, you, I don't know what your income is, but let's say that you have income uh, that puts you in the 12% tax bracket right now. If you're married filing jointly, you can make up to 78,950 bucks and stay in that bracket. If you're in the 22%, it goes all the way up to 168,000. So it's 78,9 to 168. I think I'd take money out of that SEP right now, actually, and pay down the credit card bill. I think that once you have that credit card debt paid down, then you might have a little bit more um, ability to manage your cash flow. Don't claim Social Security yet. Okay, you're listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, give us a call. Give us a shout. You can't call us anymore. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. During the break, go over to JillOnMoney.com and uh, why don't you sign up for our free weekly newsletter? Okay, we'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And if you've got a financial question, this is the show for you. And uh, hey, don't worry. We got a lot of interviews. We got a bunch of stuff in the can. You're going to not, you're going to get bored of uh, my voice very shortly. Oh, wait. That's me. I'm bored by my voice. But I promise it will be. Okay. 
Zira writes, I'm single, retired at 56 years old with no children. 56? My God. I'm, I, wait a second. I'm sorry. I'm single. I retired at 56. I'm 59 this year. 56? Let's see what this person has here. I have a pension once I reach 65 of $1,700 a month. Social Security, blah, blah, blah. Current allocation, 50% stocks, 38% uh, cash and bonds, 12% fixed annuities. I am living modestly on my bank savings. My monthly expenses, I'm sorry, I'm laughing, $2,500 a month. That's why you can retire, I guess. It includes health insurance. Um, I have several non-qualified annuities to use if I need them before Social Security. 403B. This is a teacher, I think. 640 grand. <laughs> Older fixed annuities. Bunch of money in there. Some Roth. More annuities. All this stuff. I, uh... Since my income is low, I've been taking advantage of slowly converting some of my retirement accounts into Roth IRAs. Very smart. I co-own a second home. Mortgage is $79,000. My primary home is paid in full. I have a will and a power of attorney. You're in great shape. Put it this way, gang. Let's say you are like this guy or gal, because I don't know. The name is uh, non-gender specific in my mind, at least. And you have his pension at seventeen hundred a month, plus your social security at twenty two fifty a month. <laughs> I mean, you got more money than you need. So you're about a fifty fifty investor. You're really more like a sixty forty investor. I would say. I'm sorry, sixty forty the other way. So because you have, no, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I would say fifty fifty. Let's make that fifty fifty. But part of your 50% of fixed or cash is in fixed annuities. I mean, I'm not in any rush to annuitize, create income. I would live off of what you can, the uh, bank account. I would wait to claim Social Security. Um, and I'm wondering, I mean, you've got your bank account savings. That's going to last you. You don't, you, I don't think you need to do much. And uh, you might not even need to take as much risk in the stock side of it. This is a good story. I'm just, I, I mean, it's just amazing to me to retire. I guess because I'm now I'm closing in on those mid-50s, it is a bit weird for me to consider not working. Well, I can't retire because uh, then Mark has to retire with me. Look, you're going to have your whole life ahead of you. You're going to have all these things that are going on. You're not you're going to be like leaving me in the dust. Mark's got his whole little like separate gig going on. People are going to want him doing stuff. All my colleagues, oh, I want to talk to Mark about this, talk to Mark about that. Dude, it is a long ball game. You are a long ball player, so you'll see. Um, okay. Marianne is eligible to take a reduced widow's benefit in two months. Um and has been she's been living on two thousand dollars a month from savings for the last six years. Okay, so she can take her retire her widow's benefit. She earns less than fifteen thousand dollars a year. She's got seven hundred thirty-two thousand dollars in retirement money. My plan is to take two thousand dollars a month from Social Security, stop the flood of money leaving my savings. At max retirement, I could collect twenty eight hundred dollars. I like that, Max. But you know what? She says, I like the idea my children can inherit my retirement. I like the idea of you living well. How about that? So, I mean, you could do this. Gosh, people, I don't know. I know you want to leave money to your kids, but mathematically, it would certainly make more sense for you to simply... Wait to claim Social Security, get that higher benefit, and then later you'll, the kids are going to get money. I don't know. 
You'll do what you want. It sounds to me like you don't spend a lot of money. You'll be fine. So here are two cases where people just don't spend a lot of money. So the money they've saved is more money than they need. So maybe you don't really have to do much, but I just can't, I can't, um, be like, I'm not just like the huge fan of trying to like scrimp and save and not live life when you have 700 grand and you're worried about leaving money to your kids. So I'm spend some of the money. And remember, when you wait for your Social Security, you get a guarantee of an increased paycheck. A guarantee. That's why I never like taking money early from Social Security. I mean, in your case, I don't think it's going to really change your life. Again, you don't spend a lot of money. And when you don't spend a lot of money, good news is your needs are pretty low. Your savings will cover it. All right, it's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, head over to our website, jillonmoney.com. And there you can see all the great resources we talk about. You can subscribe to our podcast and you can buy the book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we close out the program, let's do one more email from Tom because this is a fantastic question. Tom writes, I've read in many articles that you should have six times your annual salary saved by age 50. I don't know. Like, I mean, I've heard 10 times. I've heard six times. I've heard eight times. But whatever. Let's just say that there's fine. Okay. Tom's like, no problem. I've got that in my traditional IRA. But what these articles never say, says Tom, is that six, is it six times your pre-tax or six times your (gasps) post-tax? Very right. Very right you are, my friend. Six times your salary in a traditional IRA is a lot different than six times your salary in a Roth. I don't know if having six times my salary in a traditional means I've not saved enough because when you factor in taxes, I'll pay. I don't have six times my salary. Hope this makes sense. What you're really bringing up is a fantastic point, and that is that when we look at retirement planning, and even when you hear me do these like quick back-of-the-envelope calculations for people, you do have to factor in taxes and inflation. And so what I would say to you is, If you have six times your um, net salary, that's one thing. Six times your gross salary, it's another thing. And if that's in a Roth, obviously it's more valuable because it's already been taxed. But the real, but yeah, really, look, let's, what are we talking about here? You want a rule of thumb for something that's more complicated than that. So what I think you should do is forget about six times. Run your retirement numbers. See how much money you have. There are so many calculators, so many tools online, so many ways that you can do this, probably right where you hold your IRA account. Plug the numbers in, add in the the amount of money you think you'll be contributing to retirement accounts, use a very low rate of return, and see where you stand. Forget about six times, eight times, 10 times. That's going to be better. All right. Thanks so much for listening. We have been broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Go check them out at policygenius.com. And uh, next week, we're going to answer more of your questions. So please send us emails. Hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. And you can click on the Contact Us button at any time. All right, have a great week, and thanks for listening.